Chapter Five of the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, A.D. nineteen seventeen nineteen eighteen. Russians and French attack the Empire. Battle of Augsburg. Battle of Lutzen. Siege of Vienna. George the Sixth assists the Emperor Frederick. Famous March. Battle of Vienna. Russians and French driven out of Germany. George attacks France and enters Paris. Battle of Maloon. When we consider the dispositions of the three principal sovereigns at this period on the continent, it will not appear wonderful that the peace between them should not be lasting. The ambition of Peter, the cunning policy of Charles, and the weakness of Frederick form such contrasts as must necessarily produce no long friendships among them. The Emperor of Russia, ever restless and weary of peace, looked with envious eyes on the fair provinces of Germany. The weakness of the reigning emperor gave him a fair opportunity to attempt the execution of his schemes. He entered into a negotiation with Charles, which ended in a treaty aimed at Frederick. It was agreed that Mecklenburg, Pomerania, and some other of the northern provinces should be conquered and ceded to Peter, and the southern Austrian duchies to Charles. This flagrant treaty was no sooner signed than pretenses were sought for to break with the unsuspecting Frederick. Between ambitious princes these are seldom waited long. It would be endless to repeat even the titles of the memorials, answers, and rejoinders that were published between the parties. But the emperor, finding his enemies were determined to attack him, prepared for his defence. The Duke of Saxony, his general, collected his troops and found himself at the head of seventy thousand men. With these he marched against the King of France, who at the head of near one hundred thousand men had begun the war. The Duke attacked the King near Augsburg, and after a desperate and bloody battle defeated him. Footnote. September 14th. 1917. End footnote. This victory stopped the progress of the French arms, and enabled the Duke to direct his march towards Brandenburg, which was being overrun by the Russians. Peter, at the head of ninety thousand men, had taken Berlin, and two other Russian armies were making a rapid progress. The Duke of Saxony, with his victorious army, made flying marches to repel these invaders. It was not long before he had an opportunity of fighting the Tsar. About four o'clock in the morning the two armies joined battle in the very plain where Gustavus Adolphus the Great fought the Battle of Lutzen. Success hung quivering over each army for a considerable time. At last the Duke was killed, and his death was followed by the total defeat of his whole army. Footnote. October 11, 1917. This great victory was hardly gained when Peter was informed that his ally, the King of France, had recovered his late disgrace by gaining a signal victory over the electors of Hanover and Bavaria, who with fifty thousand men had taken arms in defense of the empire. Frederick's affairs were now fast advancing to ruin. The Russians on one side and the French on the other pressed him so hard that he determined with a strong garrison and plenty of provisions to shut himself up in Vienna one of the strongest cities in Europe. He sent ambassadors to George the Sixth to implore his protection, and after seeing his enemies in possession of his dominions, shut himself up in his capital, which Peter with one hundred and fifty thousand men immediately invested. The King of England, who panted for glory when honor pointed out the path, was now moved by humanity. He pitied the condition of the unhappy emperor and determined to assist him. He laid before the Parliament, ever ready to concur with their monarch in prosecuting the interest and honor of their country, the state of Europe, displayed the sad situation of the House of Brandenburg, and asked their concurrence in supporting it. The wishes of the whole kingdom attended the king in this demand, and the commons having granted the necessary supplies, George increased his forces to eighty thousand men, while his fleet was manned and ready for service in case of necessity. Very soon after, a vast fleet of transports wafted the king, at the head of sixty thousand of the bravest troops in the world, to the coast of Flanders. Had the emperor been in a less critical situation, he could have drawn one of his enemies off by marching to Paris. But nothing could save Frederick except raising the siege of Vienna. 
George therefore lost no time, but began a long and dangerous march through a country wholly possessed by the enemy. He had with him a vast train of artillery and a multitude of baggage wagons, yet thus encumbered, he ventured on one of the most dangerous expeditions that ever was known. All the passes, quite from Flanders to Austria, were in the hands of the French and Russians. He had many fortresses to pass by, and a prodigious number of rivers to cross. Yet all these difficulties, so far from slackening the activity of the king, served only to spur him more eagerly on. The particulars of this celebrated march are well known. George, almost without the loss of a man, arrived in Austria on the banks of the Danube, after one of the most expeditious marches ever known. He slipped by three armies whose only business was to intercept him. He passed every river in safety, and to the astonishment of all the world, was in a condition to fight the Tsar of Muscovy almost as soon as that monarch had heard of his approach. Peter immediately raised the siege, and drawing up his forces in the plains of Vienna, prepared to fight the King of England, who was also engaged in the same employment. The Russian army had a superiority of above sixty thousand men. Consequently their numbers were two to one. But no dangers could depress the heart of George. Having with moving batteries secured the rear and wings of his army from being surrounded, he placed his artillery in the most advantageous manner, and dividing his front into two lines, at the head of the first he began the attack, after his artillery had played on the enemy an hour, with great success. The Russian infantry, animated by the presence of their Tsar, under whom they had so often conquered, repulsed him with some loss. The king hereupon made a second and still more furious attack, but yet without success. At that critical moment the Duke of Devonshire, who commanded his left wing, sent for immediate assistance, as he was hard-pressed by the superior numbers of the enemy. George flew like lightning to his weakened troops, and placing himself at the head of six regiments of dragoons, made such a furious attack on the eager Russians, as threw them into disorder, and following his advantage pushed them with great success. Thus having given his left time to rally and renew the attack, he returned to the centre where his presence was equally wanted. The Tsar, having repulsed his two first attacks, and finding the English at a stand, not knowing the reason, made a most violent and well-directed assault on them, which being repulsed he renewed it with still greater vigour. The King of England coming up at that moment, and placing himself at the head of fifteen thousand horse, attacked the centre of the Russian army with such irresistible impetuosity that he bore down all before him. Every effort the Tsar could make proved ineffectual. The King, pursuing his success, renewed his attacks on the broken enemy, which threw their whole army into the utmost confusion. The Tsar ordered a retreat, but it was made in miserable order. The King dispatched the Duke of Devonshire to pursue the enemy with thirty thousand men, who made a prodigious slaughter, the vast numbers of the Russians only increasing their confusion. Footnote. May twentieth, 1918. In footnote. Thus did this magnanimous monarch gain this glorious victory against double his own number, over some of the best troops in Europe, who had been used to victory. Never could George show more distinguishing proofs of a most heroic courage than the king in this great day. This victory was thoroughly complete. Thirty-five thousand Russians were left dead in the field of battle, twenty-four thousand made prisoners, and thirteen thousand wounded. In short, the Tsar, before he arrived in Denmark, had lost above eighty thousand men, a loss in one battle almost unparalleled. The trophies were two hundred pieces of brass cannon, besides colours, and drums, etc., without number, and their military chest was taken, containing above thirty millions of roubles, a prodigious sum. But the greatness of the king's victory was best seen in its consequences. The Emperor Frederick embraced him as his deliverer, and Germany was entirely cleared of both Russians and French. For Charles, on the news of the Battle of Vienna, which was like a thunderbolt to him, had abandoned all his hasty acquisitions, and retired into France to prepare for King George's reception, as he every day expected an attack. Nor was he mistaken. The king had no sooner seen the emperor firm on his late tottering throne, than he directed his march toward France, determining to punish Charles for his unjust attack on Frederick. He met with no opposition, and entered France as he would have entered England. 
In three weeks the whole Duchy of Lorraine was subdued, and Reims opened its gates to the conqueror. George advanced towards Paris with hasty marches. The court in the greatest terror retired to Orléans, and on the 6th of September, 1918, the King of England entered Paris at the head of his victorious army. The whole French nation were astonished at the success of George, and a general despondency ensued everywhere but in the breast of Charles. That prince was in the neighborhood of Lyon, at the head of a powerful army, but in doubt whether he should fight the English or no. His very crown was at stake. A defeat must inevitably strip him of his dominions, and, on the other hand, a pusillanimous conduct could not but sink the spirits of his people still lower, and be attended with perhaps as fatal consequences. But the rapid success of the King of England hardly allowed him time to think. That monarch had divided his army into two parts. With one he was overrunning Normandy, while the Duke of Devonshire with the other was conquering Picardy, the Isle of France, and Champagne. By the end of October all the northern provinces of France were in the hands of the English. In the meantime Charles had increased his army to one hundred and thirty thousand men, but the greater part were but indifferently disciplined. A large body of French troops were in the service of the King of Venice, and were now on their march home. But without staying for these, Charles advanced towards Paris. George immediately collected his forces, and prudently entrenched himself in a very advantageous spot. Here the King of France attacked him, and fought in that desperate manner which might be expected from a brave man whose kingdom was at stake. But the genius of George prevailed. The English cannon were placed so advantageously, and so well served, that every attack the French could make served but to increase the prodigious number of their slain. Charles at last drew off his men from the attack, when the King of England, letting loose ten thousand horse on the weakened and almost vanquished enemy, completed his victory, with the total defeat of the French. Footnote. November 7, 1918. In footnote. Orléans, Brittany, and Burgundy were immediately overrun by the English troops. But winter coming on, the king left the command in France to the Duke of Devonshire, and crossing the water landed in England, where he was received by all his expecting subjects with the loudest acclamations of unfeigned joy. End of chapter 5 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter Six of the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six, A.D. nineteen nineteen to nineteen twenty. War renewed, siege and relief of Orleans, the king wounded, Battle of Arlo, Battle of Alençon, Death of King Charles, George re enters Paris leaves France and returns to England. The King of England, who thought he had done nothing while he had anything to do, was soon in France. His troops, having enjoyed every necessary refreshment, were collected very early in the spring and rendezvoused in the neighborhood of Paris. Charles, on his side, did everything that industry, artifice, or bravery could effect to retrieve the terrible condition of his affairs. He had applied to the court of Madrid for succors and had met with success. The King of Spain furnished him with money, and by his great vigilance he had collected his army as soon as his enemy. George opened the campaign by besieging Orléans, a city of the greatest importance, and Charles determined to attempt relieving it. He formed a scheme for surprising the King in his entrenchments. One dark night, about twelve o'clock, he advanced with near thirty thousand men through a hollow way which led to the King's lines. By some well-conducted motions he cut off the advanced guards, and knocking down several sentinels made a vigorous attack on the English entrenchments. The troops, unprepared for action, ran hastily to their arms. The king flew to the quarter where Charles made his attack, and found General Shipton at the head of four regiments which were by that time half-formed, sustaining the vigorous efforts of the French. He rallied and formed his men as fast as possible, but with all the coolness imaginable. No effort was left untried by our young monarch to repulse the enemy. He drove them back twice, but still they renewed the attack. At last George unfortunately was wounded in the side by a musket ball, and carried off the field. No other stroke could be half so despairing to his troops. 
They gave way almost immediately, but yet the Earl of Berry retired with tolerable good order. The English commanders greatly distinguished themselves in this action, particularly the Earl who conducted the retreat. Footnote. May 7, 1919. End footnote. Charles fought with the greatest bravery and led on his troops with the most heroic firmness. He showed equal conduct and courage in the scheming and executing his plan. He revived by this action the spirits of his whole kingdom. It was indeed no inconsiderable honor to triumph over the King of England, though the wound that young hero received was Charles' best friend. But the victory greatly raised his reputation. The English were obliged to raise the siege immediately, and the king was carried to Mayenne. His wound was not dangerous, but was not likely to be healed soon. Nothing could exceed the sorrow of the whole army at this unhappy accident. They loved the king as a father, and never fought under him but with an eager certainty of victory. All his dominions wept on receiving the news, and offered up the most fervent prayers to heaven for his recovery. The Duke of Devonshire commanded a small army in Paris, and hearing of the king's defeat was at some difficulty to know how to proceed. Charles was on the full march to his capital, and his troops were too few to oppose him, yet he could not quit the city without orders. However, he soon received them from the king to join the troops under the Earl of Berry. It was with some difficulty that he effected this, for Charles was bent on making him and his whole army prisoners but slipping by him he made three forced marches and joined the royal army, of which he then took the command. Touraine, Berry, Nivernois, the Isle of France, Champagne, and part of Normandy were soon overrun by the French troops. Charles found his army was increased to near two hundred thousand men in high spirits at his late victory. But what chiefly increased his reputation was the possession of Paris. Flushed at the fair appearance his affairs wore, he thought of giving battle to the Duke of Devonshire before George was well enough to command in person. His generals, indeed, all advised him against the scheme, and represented to him that the English army would decrease every day, that his subjects were so inspirited with his late success that they would rise against his enemies wherever they still possessed the command, but that in hazarding a battle he put all his advantages to the stake at once, and at a time when defeat must be attended with the most fatal consequences. These representations had little effect on Charles. Impatient for a complete victory, he collected 120,000 men, and at the head of that vast army began his march to attack the English. The king had been some days removed to Cain, when he was informed of the motions of Charles. He sent immediate orders to the Duke of Devonshire to fortify himself in the strongest manner, and to choose the best situation for a camp for that purpose. His grace obeyed the command without delay, and fixed on an admirable situation at Con Lee. Footnote. Oddly enough, Con Lee was to see a great camp in the 19th century. It was the place chosen for the mobilization of the Breton Guard Mobile in the autumn of 1870 during the Franco-German War. In footnote. He soon rendered his camp impregnable, and was at the same time able to receive all sorts of supplies from the country behind him. The Earl of Berry, with 8,000 men, was at Alençon, and General Villiers, with 10,000, at Rennes, so that the three armies formed a line which perfectly secured them. On the 3rd of June, footnote, 1919, end footnote, Charles arrived in sight of the English camp, but was surprised to find out how admirably everything was disposed for his reception. He found it was impossible to attack the Duke with the least prospect of success. He assaulted several of his posts, but always met such a reception as convinced him that nothing could be effected. He turned off towards Paris after this ineffectual march, and laid siege to Chartres, a strong fortress and nearer to the capital than any other in the hands of the English. The King of France had hardly undertaken the siege before he had intelligence of an event which both obliged him to raise it and gave him great uneasiness. General Summers had commanded an army of 20,000 English in Flanders from the opening of the war. Charles had lately detached the Marquis de Senetraire at the head of 40,000 men to give him battle, or prevent his joining the Duke of Devonshire, as he had made some motions which indicated a design to undertake that dangerous expedition. Senetraire, with all the rashness of a young soldier, for he was but 22, 
attacked Summers in his strong entrenchments, and after a sharp engagement was totally defeated. The English general made the best use of so fortunate an affair. The battle was fought near Arlo, and quitting the field he made a flying march with his victorious troops to Amiens. From thence he fled toward Rouen, when the king of France, being alarmed at the celerity of his marches, determined to raise the siege of Chartres, and hastened himself to meet him. George, whose wound now began to heal, was in pain for his brave general, and finding himself pretty well recovered, resolved to place himself at the head of his army. He was advised against it by his surgeons, but in vain. The impetuosity of his courage could not be stopped, and he arrived at the camp the twenty-ninth of June. He immediately drew his forces out of their entrenchments, and calling in the detachments commanded by the Earl of Berry and General Villiers, he again found himself at the head of a gallant army of seventy thousand men in good spirits, and who longed to wipe off their late disgrace. Charles had marched to Bretoul to intercept Summers, and he had stationed his troops in so judicious a manner that the Englishmen could not pass him. The King of England, having drawn in all his scattered troops, moved toward the French King, who prepared to receive him in the most vigorous manner. It was plainly foreseen that a general engagement must quickly ensue, for Charles drew up his army to the amount of one hundred and twenty thousand men in order of battle on the plains of Alençon. George came in sight of him the fourth of July, and prepared that night to give him battle. The French army was posted in the most advantageous manner. In their front was a rivulet, behind which were nine redoubts mounted with cannon. Their wings were defended in the same manner, and every approach guarded with artillery. The king, having reconnoitred the enemy's position, drew up his troops on the same plain at some distance in their front. As the French army outspread his, he disposed his cannon in his wings in such a manner as to prevent his being surrounded. Himself commanded the center, the Duke of Devonshire the right, and the Earl of Berry the left. Everything being prepared for the engagement, the king ordered the signal to be made for beginning it. And about nine in the morning that battle began, which at once was to decide the fate of two mighty kingdoms. The French army was the most numerous and commanded by their king. The monarch of the English also headed them, and they were eager to engage and obliterate by their bravery the memory of their late defeat. The fire of the artillery was the beginning of this great action. As the British troops advanced under cover of their own cannon, that of the enemy played on them with great fury and some effect. But the skill of the English engineers so well directed their fire that several batteries of the enemy were thrown into confusion. The king, however, soon brought on warmer work. At the head of the first line of his centre he began the attack which was received with firmness. The Earl of Berry at the same time with the left fell on the right of the French. For about an hour the success of the day was doubtful. But the right of the English army then beginning the attack threw the French into a little confusion. Charles, however, flying with great celerity from his centre, repulsed the Duke of Devonshire and attacked him in his turn, drawing off a part of his centre to sustain his left. The Duke repelled his attack, but it was renewed with such vigour that he found it necessary to send an aide-de-camp to the King for assistance. George drew twenty battalions from his centre, and all his horse from his left. This was a most masterfully and rapid motion. Just as the Duke was thinking of a retreat, the King came up at the head of his fresh troops. The field of battle was now almost changed. The French had been so often repulsed in their attacks that it was even dangerous to pursue their advantage after the great loss they had suffered. But Charles, contrary to the advice of his generals, renewed his attack after George was arrived. The French troops, fatigued with fighting almost three hours in a hot day, made but a faint impression. The king easily repulsed them, and placing himself at the head of his cavalry, made a most furious attack on his almost defeated enemies. Nothing resisted him. The whole French army was broke through in a moment, and the slaughter that ensued was terrible. While the king burst through every battalion of French with the irresistible fury of his cavalry, General Young brought up sixty pieces of cannon which played on their broken troops near an hour. All the efforts of Charles were in vain. The battle was lost beyond the power of recovery. And to complete the misfortunes of the French, their king, as he was endeavouring to rally his men, was killed by a cannon-ball. 
the Earl of Berry, with twenty thousand men, pursued the flying enemy and made a vast multitude of prisoners. Never was any battle more critically won. The English army was on the point of being defeated, which would certainly have been its fate had not the king recovered all, by one of the most masterly strokes of generalship recorded in history. Never was there a braver soldier or a more complete commander. Both characters he equally displayed in this celebrated battle. He received a slight wound in his left arm and had three horses killed under him, and during the whole action exposed his person in the hottest fire. In killed and wounded he lost seven thousand men. But what is remarkable, not one officer of great note. The French nation never sustained a more terrible blow, never one more decisive. Besides the king they lost thirty-two thousand men killed, nine thousand wounded, and twelve thousand prisoners, in all fifty-three thousand, an amazing number, among whom were the princes of Condé and Charleroi of the royal blood, the dukes of St. Omer, Rochefoucauld, Ventador, Amiens, and D'Elu, many other nobility of great rank, thirteen lieutenant-generals and five major-generals, all killed. Among the prisoners were the dukes of Bordeaux, Rennes, St. Clair, Doyne, the Marshal Suivione, and three major-generals, besides many others of rank, one hundred and fifty pieces of cannon, seventy mortars, and all the baggage of the army, with drums, standards, and colors without number being taken. But the prodigious consequences of this victory best proved its decisiveness. The road was open to Paris. George, at the head of his victorious army, took it. His detachments overrun the whole province of Orléanois, even to Nevers. He himself made a triumphant entry into Paris, and Philip the Seventh, the new French king, hardly reigned in his capital before he was obliged to fly from it. All Picardy was immediately conquered. The English themselves were amazed at the rapidity of their own success. Montargis, Saint, Troyes, and Auxerre opened their gates to the conqueror. The strongest fortresses held out but a few days, so universal was the terror which spread over all France. They had no prospect of relief. King Charles, who just before the Battle of Alençon, which robbed him of his crown and his life, saw himself at the head of two hundred thousand men, left a successor who had not even ten thousand about his own person, and yet half France was in his possession. But the English prosecuted their success with so much vigor that every moment brought him tidings of their conquests. The rapidity with which George followed his blow surprised all Europe. By the beginning of August he was in the entire possession of Normandy, Brittany, the whole province of Orléanois, the Isle of France, Champagne, Picardy, and Flanders. He had small detachments making important conquests in other provinces. The Duke of Devonshire acted in Lorraine, the Earl of Berry in Burgundy, General Summers in Hainault, and General Villiers watched the motions of Philip, who had retired to Lyon. Thus the English were in possession of near half France. These wonderful successes, while they called to mind the remote days of Edward the Third and Henry the Fifth, yet totally eclipsed them, and though a very great share of admiration was paid to the names of those celebrated heroes, a degree considerably higher attended the name of George. The heroic monarch who was at Paris found himself much disordered after his late fatigues. His wound had not received sufficient indulgence to complete a cure, so that his physicians by all means advised him to return for a short time to England, and repose himself after the vast fatigues he had undergone. The king, who found himself very indifferent, followed their advice and leaving the command in France to the Duke of Devonshire with orders to prosecute the war with the utmost vigour, he left that kingdom and arrived at London the 1st of September, 1919. End of section 8. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 7 of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925 to A forecast written in the year 1763. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, A.D. 1919-1920 Foreign Affairs Spain and Russia intervene in the war Treaty of Madrid Preparations in Great Britain Parliament meets An Allied army mobilized in Switzerland 
Duke of Devonshire conquers Flanders and Holland. George could not have left France at a more critical time. His prodigious successes had kindled the jealousy of several of his neighbors, who wished to see the rapidity of his conquests stopped. A series of victories had raised his character as a commander to an extreme high pitch. He possessed the reputation of not only being the greatest general of his time, but even one of the most celebrated that ever existed. He was the sovereign of a powerful kingdom, and was equally formidable both by sea and land. He had given France a terrible blow by one successful battle, and bid fair to conquer the whole kingdom in another campaign. These circumstances, at the same time that they raised the jealousy of his neighbors, equally occasioned a dread of his power. All wished to clip his soaring wings, but no one singly dared to attempt it. His old enemy, the Tsar Peter, was engaged in a second war with the Turkish Emperor Bajazet, which had been carried on with various success for two campaigns, and a late rebellion of the Danes under Count Stormer had obliged him to divide his land forces. Yet engaged as he was, he was ready to come into any alliance against the King of Great Britain. Indeed, he could no longer be the enemy he formerly proved, for the Russian fleet, as its rise was swift, so its declension was rapid, and powerful as Peter had lately been at sea, yet he was now by no means in a condition of making any naval opposition of consequence to the fleets of England. Charles V, who at this time sat on the throne of Spain, was a weak prince, but governed by the Count de Leon, a minister of great abilities and unbounded ambition. From the moment George distinguished himself on the continent of Europe, he became his enemy professed, and by his intrigues endeavoured to unite the whole of Europe against him. He had supplied the late King of France with immense sums of money, he had put the whole force of Spain in motion, and waited only for a proper opportunity to declare openly against the King of Great Britain. Spain was in a flourishing condition. The acquisition of Portugal and Brazil was very considerable, and having been so fortunate as to possess a succession of able ministers, her revenues were in good order, and her forces well disciplined and numerous. She had a fleet of forty sail of the line ready manned besides frigates. Italy at this time enjoyed a profound peace, the kings of Sicily and Venice having for some time compromised all their disputes. The Emperor Frederick the Ninth was in close alliance with George, and the German princes neutral, but ready to let their troops to whoever would hire them. The Swiss cantons were also in friendship with Great Britain. Footnote. Stevenson, Volume 1, page 63, in footnote. Such was the state of Europe when the Battle of Alençon struck a terror into most of its sovereigns. The Count de Leon had some time before entered into a negotiation with the Tsar to form an alliance against George. This battle hastened their proceedings, and a treaty was soon agreed on between them for the protection of Philip and signed at Madrid. Peter engaged to join the Spanish fleet with sixty sail of the line and to send ten thousand foot and five thousand horse to assist Philip. Spain was to march an army of sixty thousand men into France to act against the English. In return, Philip engaged, as soon as George was driven out of his dominions, to assist Charles with all his forces, and to recover Milan from the King of Sicily. Footnote. Was this for the benefit of the King of Venice? or was Spain dreaming of recovering Milan, lost since 1712? End footnote. The last article was secret, but his Sicilian majesty found means to come at the designs of his enemies. The 1st of October the King of Spain declared war against Great Britain, and on the 9th he was followed by the Tsar. George, in the meantime, was not dilatory in opposing both preparations and negotiations against those of his enemies. He no sooner arrived in England than he dispatched orders to Milford for a squadron of twenty ships of the line and fourteen frigates to be equipped with all expedition, another of ten sail and eleven frigates at Portsmouth, twenty line of battleships and nine frigates at Hull, fifteen sail were almost ready for sea at Plymouth, nine at Cork in Ireland, and five in Lynn. In all, seventy-nine sail of the line besides frigates. He had a squadron of fifteen sail off Toulon, under Admiral Tonson, and ten in the channel commanded by Phillips. 
the duke of grafton hastened down to hull to quicken the preparations for fitting out the grand squadron which was to sail for the baltic from thence orders were given for the fleets at plymouth portsmouth and lynn with the squadron in the channel to rendezvous at hull as fast as they were got ready for service that a powerful fleet might sail from thence early in the spring before a russian one could come out of the baltic never were such prodigious preparations carried on in a more spirited manner new ships were building at all the ports of great britain and ireland and even in the immense colonies of america four ships of forty guns each were on the stocks at quebec ten at boston and five at philadelphia nor was the king's attention only carried towards his navy twenty new regiments were raised in great britain and eight in ireland all sorts of military preparations went on with equal vigour the parliament meeting in the beginning of winter the session was opened with a very sensible speech from the throne in which his majesty laid before them the state of affairs both at home and abroad he explained the necessity of prosecuting the war in the most vigorous manner and repelling all attacks that might be made by the members of the alliance which was formed against him there were two parties at this time in the parliament the one was for making a peace as soon as possible to avoid a war with all europe these urged that the conquests his majesty had made in france however glorious they might seem were certainly contrary to the interest of the kingdom as it would be highly absurd to think of keeping them even if it was in our power this was their chief argument and the duke of bedford who was in disgrace was at their head but as the opposite party who were entirely guided by the pleasure of the king so great was his reputation and so universal was the good opinion entertained of him were much the strongest after a few debates it was determined to address his majesty and to thank him for his design of prosecuting the war with vigour and before they were prorogued they granted him thirteen millions every shilling of which was raised by taxes within the year to the surprise of all europe so extensive was the british trade at the time his majesty's negotiations were as spirited as his military preparations he sent the earl of chesterfield as ambassador to the emperor frederick the duke of marlborough to the king of sicily and mr wharton to the states of switzerland a treaty was soon signed between himself the emperor and his sicilian majesty in opposition to the alliance frederick engaged to attack the russians if they entered the empire and george took ten thousand of his men into his pay the king of sicily furnished him with ten thousand more at his own expense on condition that they should be recalled if that monarch was attacked himself and that the king of great britain should send an army of twenty thousand men to his assistance moreover george hired eight thousand bavarians and six thousand swiss infantry such were the measures this vigilant monarch took to repulse the attempts of his powerful enemies no sooner was these treaties signed than the ten thousand troops furnished by the king of sicily marched from the neighbourhood of turin and crossing the alps near bornico joined the swiss troops and remained in camp till the imperialists and bavarians arrived when they formed an army of thirty four thousand men footnote this is an unintelligible march does the author mean bormio if so the army followed the valtelleri route but this would be a bad one for reaching zurich its ultimate goal perhaps jornico is meant and the st goddard line was taken End footnote. the king sent the duke of devonshire orders to detach the earl of berry with five thousand men to put himself at their head and lead them into france this was no easy task philip who had recruited his army and was reinforced with fifteen thousand spaniards lay in his way to intercept him french comte part of lorraine and alsace were in his possession so that the road to switzerland was entirely blocked up but this able general deceived the french king or rather the marshal saletta who had the command and making a flying march passed by his army and entered switzerland in safety the allied troops were in the neighborhood of zurich berry placing himself at their head entered french comte without opposition for Saletta was too weak, though far superior in numbers, to prevent him. Perceiving the weakness of the enemy, Berry laid siege to Besançon, expecting an easy conquest, but a brave governor commanding in it, he was obliged to open the trenches against it. In the meantime, his grace of Devonshire was not idle, 
he had collected forty thousand men to drive Philip from Lyon and attack that city. But an unforeseen event changed his design. General Somers, who commanded ten thousand men in Hainault, was unfortunately surprised in a dark night by a small body of the enemy's troops in that province, and the Frenchman pursuing his blow was attended with some success. This affair called off the attention of the Duke from the southern parts, and pointed out the necessity of first reducing all the northern provinces. Instead, therefore, of marching to Lyon, he moved with his army towards Flanders. The French troops, although elated with their success, did not dare to stand their ground. Their commander very prudently gave up all thoughts of keeping the field against the Duke, and conjecturing that his grace would not make so long a march without attempting to reduce the country, he divided his troops into small parties, and threw them into the strong towns in the Flemish provinces. The sea-coast was already in the hands of the English, quite to Blankenburg, with the whole province of Artois. Devonshire, being joined by General Somers and his scattered troops, divided his army into two parts, with one Somers advanced toward Namur, with the design to take that city, and afterwards to reduce all the adjacent provinces. The Duke at the head of the other made a flying march to Antwerp, and surprised that city. His detachments, by the way, conquered all Dutch Brabant, and Dutch Flanders. This country, so famous in history, was no longer the strongest spot in Europe. Many of that vast list of fortresses, which in the great Marlborough's day took so much time to master, now opened their gates to the Duke of Devonshire on the first summons. Having secured the provinces in his rear, he advanced into Liege, and coasting along the Meuse, took Nimogen. Nothing now opposed the most rapid conquests. Whole provinces were overrun in a few days. The French garrisons in Holland were weak to the last degree, and the Dutch, whose spirits were sunk in their slavery, had no inclination to assist their cruel masters. Rotterdam, The Hague, Utrecht, and even Amsterdam itself, opened its gates to the conqueror. In one word, all the seven provinces were in the hands of the English by the end of the campaign, December 1919 to January 1920. General Somers had no less success in his expedition. Namur surrendered in five days, and Luxembourg, part of Champagne and Lorraine, were immediately conquered. This prodigious success struck a damp into George's enemies. While Philip was lying inactive and waiting for reinforcements, the English had conquered an immense territory and were every day extending their possessions. The Duke, leaving twenty thousand men under Somers to take up their quarters in the conquered country, returned with the rest of his army to winter in Paris. End of chapter 7 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 8 of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925 to A forecast written in the year 1763 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8, A.D. 1920 Naval victories over the Russians Duke of Lerma marches into France Motions of the British and French armies. Celebrated march to Saint Flour. Philip arrives at Paris. Battle of Espalion. Battle of Paris. The conquest of France. Conquest of Mexico. Philippine Islands reduced. Duke of Devonshire enters Spain. General Peace signed at Paris November the first, nineteen twenty. The enterprising disposition of George would not suffer him to defer opening the campaign the moment he was able. In the beginning of April, footnote, 1920, footnote, the Duke of Grafton sailed from Hull with sixty ships of the line and thirty-five frigates to the mouth of the Baltic. He soon learned that the Russian fleet was not even collected. Thirty sail of the line were anchored off Stockholm in expectation of being joined by twenty more from Petersburg, when they were ready to rendezvous at Copenhagen, where twenty sail were ready for the sea. Footnote. This reads very like the state of affairs in the Baltic in 1801, when Nelson made his great stroke to keep apart the squadrons isolated at Stockholm, Kronstadt, and Copenhagen. In footnote. The Duke no sooner gained this intelligence than he immediately entered the Baltic, and steering towards Stockholm designed to fall on the Russian fleet before they had advice of his approach. He executed his scheme with all imaginable success. In a dark night he sent in six fire-ships among their squadron. The effect was terrible and fatal to the enemy. 
eleven ships of the line were burnt, and seven frigates, four sunk and seven taken. The rest were greatly damaged and totally dispersed. This decisive blow, which at once disabled the enemy from appearing at sea during the war, was a thunderbolt to Peter, who was then with his army overrunning Denmark, which had rebelled against him. However, rather to make a parade of power than in hopes of retrieving the misfortune, he gave orders that the loss should be instantly repaired, and all endeavors seemed to be directed to raising his navy. But it was in vain. The Duke of Grafton, following his blow, sailed to Petersburg. He bombarded the city three days to the other ruin of everything but the fortifications, and by a bold and well-conducted attempt he landed three thousand men to attack the fort that defended the basin. It was carried in a moment, and this glorious expedition ended with burning the whole Russian fleet of twenty sail, after a defense, indeed, which did great honor to the enemy's courage. After two such decisive strokes the presence of the Duke was no longer necessary in the Baltic. He left it and setting sail for England anchored at Hull with his victorious fleet. The king with his own hand wrote a most friendly letter to the duke, thanking him for his great and eminent services, particularly in this signal success. He soon after ordered him to sail for the coast of Spain, and gave him orders to annoy the enemy in whatever manner should seem best to himself. He was limited only to the coast of that kingdom. His Majesty, before he left England, gave orders for a fleet of ten sail of the line and eight frigates, to sail for the West Indies to prosecute the war in that part of the world. They were to convoy transports, with three thousand infantry on board, who were designed to attack Mexico under General Cannon. These were to land at New Orleans. Footnote. An odd place to choose for landing to attack Mexico, but our author's geography is not at its best in America. End footnote. The fleet was commanded by Admiral Newport. Another squadron was ordered to be got ready with all expedition for the East Indies to attack the Spanish possessions in that quarter under Admiral Clinton. The preparations of the king had been prodigious, yet ships were still wanting and were fitting out every day. It was indeed surprising how this active monarch could give his attention equally to every object of such a prodigious extensive war. Before the Duke of Grafton had destroyed the Russian fleet, George was landed in France. He carried with him eight regiments of foot and three of dragoons, which had been but lately raised. He found the Duke of Devonshire drawing his troops out of their winter quarters and collected them near Nevers. This business the king hastened with all expedition, for he designed to take the field before the Spanish army under the Duke of Lerma had joined Philip. It consisted of fifty thousand men and was in full march for France. Philip himself had spared no pains to augment his troops. He had thrown strong garrisons into all his fortresses, and his army designed for the field amounted to seventy thousand men, which he was collecting with all expedition. The King of England, by the latter end of April, found himself at the head of sixty thousand conquering troops. He had besides twenty thousand in garrisons, twenty thousand in Flanders under Summers, and five thousand in camp near Santez, commanded by General Young who watched ten thousand of Philip's troops that had been detached to penetrate into Orléanois, but without effect. Dijon, Mecon, and Bourg were now the only places in Burgundy in the possession of the French. George detached ten thousand men under General Cleveland to reduce those fortresses, which it was expected would prove an easy task, as the two first were cut off from all communication with Philip's army. After performing this service, he was to join the king in the neighborhood of Lyon. His Majesty on the 3rd of May left Nevers, and marched to Moulin. The governor, Du Roquet, deserted it at his approach. The king, leaving a garrison in it, directed his march to Bourbon, with the design to reduce all the places on the Loire, and joining General Cleveland lay siege to Lyon, which he made no doubt would draw Philip to a battle, as the loss of that city would be fatal to his affairs. Footnote. Duchamp, tome six, page forty-seven, in footnote. This excellent plan showed the genius of the king, and the execution was equal to the design. By a happy expedition which always threw his enemy into confusion, George became master of Dijon, Semur, Boisse, and a strong fort which commanded an important pass at Tarare, which opened him the road to Lyon. 
General Cleveland had met with equal success in his expedition. Philip detached two thousand men to oppose him, but the English general, by making a flying march, deceived him, and conquered the three towns almost as soon as he had attacked them. Footnote. Dijon, Macon, and Bourg. End footnote. Having thus performed the chief end of his expedition, he marched to join his master with little or no opposition, and effected it with as little loss. The French were but spectators of their enemy's success. The King of France, who was guided in all his military operations by Marshal Saleta, was terrified at the sudden approach of his victorious enemy. The Duke of Lerma had not yet entered France. He was perplexed what course to take determined not to hazard a battle he was in great fear of the king's attacking Lyon. there was in that city a garrison of eight thousand men yet he depended but little on their defence if he encamped under its walls he knew it would be safe but then it would be in george's power to cut off his junction with the spanish army on the contrary if he marched towards spain to join it Lyon he gave up as lost and perhaps other places of great importance might partake its fate Thus confused between different opinions, he at last was guided by his general, who urged him to entrench himself strongly under the walls of Lyon, as George, he supposed, through his impetuosity, would aim at taking him and his army prisoners, and would neglect to cut off his communication with Spain. George, whose camp was near Boissy, immediately perceived the oversight of the enemy. He took no time to spend in tedious consideration, but seeing that the whole fortune of the war depended on his preventing the junction of the French and Spaniards, he determined to exert every effort to cut off all their communications. There was the greater necessity for expedition, as the Duke of Lerma had entered France and was arriving at Foix. Footnote. An unlikely point for him to appear at, as it would seem that he must have crossed the Pyrenees at one of their least accessible points in order to reach it. He would really have marched by Figueras and Perpignan. In footnote. The scheme was difficult to execute, for all the country before him was full of strong towns with garrisons in them. His plan was to march to saint Fleur, but Riom, Clermont, and Issois lay so near his road that it would be extremely difficult to pass without reducing them. Without losing a moment's time, therefore, he made a flying march to Riom and presenting himself before it, required the governor to surrender immediately at discretion. Terrified at George's approach, he surrendered without firing a gun. But his cowardice, however, cost him dear, for he was afterwards shot for his behavior by the command of his master. George, having thrown a garrison into Riam, marched with no less expedition to Clermont, and expecting the same speedy success, but the prince of that name, being lord of the town, commanded in it, and returned a haughty answer to George. His majesty immediately surrounded the town, and at night about ten o'clock made three violent attacks on it in different quarters. Never was action more obstinately fought, but some scaling ladders breaking at the principal attack, and the bravery of the French throwing his men into confusion, he was obliged to draw off his troops with the loss of two thousand five hundred men. The king, who expected that Philip would march with all expedition to join the Spanish army in time, resolved to lose none, and quitting the attack on Clermont, determined, as Riom was in his possession, to pass on without it. His Majesty, using the same expedition, advanced to Issois, which to his utter astonishment he found deserted. Pursuing his march, therefore, he arrived at saint Fleur, and was hardly in sight of the town before he ordered it to be attacked. The fury of this attack, which was made at once in five places, only seemed to raise the courage of the governor. But nothing could resist the English. After four hours' hot action, they carried it by storm. This celebrated march, which was one of the most expeditious ever known, was performed in eight days, a rapidity that was astonishing. The king, by such prodigious celerity, however, prevented the two armies of French and Spaniards from joining. He expected, indeed, that Philip would take a different course as fast as possible to effect the junction, but herein he was mistaken. Philip, or rather Saleta, no sooner saw how far George had got the start of him than he perceived the extreme difficulty of joining the Spaniards, and knowing that the operation of the whole campaign must be greatly retarded by waiting for the Duke of Lerma, he determined to make a resolute push to recover the capital in the northern provinces of his kingdom. 
the attempt must necessarily be attended with great difficulty, but he was nevertheless determined in his resolution. Had it been possible, he would have taken the straight road to Paris. But the English possessed a multitude of garrisons in his way that rendered such a march impracticable. Therefore, breaking up his camp with very little noise, he took the route of Bourg, designing to make a great detour through French Comte and Champagne. Bourg surrendered without a blow. From thence he marched with great expedition to Dole. His plan in this march was the same as that of George in his southern one. He determined to leave every town behind him that made any great resistance. The governor of Dole refused to surrender, and Philip, despairing of taking it by storm, passed on to Langres. The officer who commanded there had not the same courage, but left the town an easy conquest to the French. Cezanne gave him as little trouble, from whence, after a very rapid march, he arrived at Paris, which was never able to resist an army. May ninth, 1920 Nothing could raise the spirits of his subjects more than this stroke. He expected to be soon master of all the northern provinces, as he depended on the Duke of Lerma's finding the King of England employment in the south. But we shall leave him here a little while to take a view of the operations between George and the Spaniards. The Duke had advanced to Toulouse, and hearing that Philip was marching to Paris, he exclaimed against this perfidy of the French in the highest terms. He reproached them with breaking their engagements, as they were to join him and to act in concert with his army. The Spanish minister was no less loud in his complaints, but it was too late for Philip to change his plan, and the Duke, with all possible caution, advanced to Toulouse. He knew the genius of the man that commanded against him, and was determined to leave nothing to fortune, to hazard no action of consequence but to keep advancing and find the King of England an employment, while Philip was overrunning the northern provinces. His plan was the most prudent he could have chosen, and he had a genius proper to execute it. When he arrived at that city he learned of George's being at Mende, upon which he still advanced to Albi and Rodet, and from the situation of the king was in hopes of being able to make a flying march, and yet join Philip. But the king of Great Britain knew it was impossible for the duke to take advantage of his motion, from the situation of his outposts, the passes of which were all in his command. Lerma was at Espalion and just as his army was beginning to move, one of his aides de camp brought him intelligence that the king was at Albrock in his front, but four miles from him. Alarmed at this news and dreading a battle, he instantly ordered his troops to arms, and they moved forthwith into their camp, at the same time receiving orders to raise new entrenchments and redoubts. The king had made this sudden and rapid motion with a design to bring on a battle, judging it a favorable opportunity when the Spaniards were on the march. However, finding that the Duke was taking every precaution that was possible, he gave over the design, and the two armies continued in the same position a week, during which time George was incessantly attacking the out-parties and convoys of the Duke, and trying to provoke him to a battle. But it was in vain, for the cautious Spaniard kept close in his camp, and very quietly saw the King victorious in every skirmish. But this petit guerre was the King's aversion, though he understood it well. He loved hazardous actions in which fortune played a part. He was tired if a continued series of battles, rapid marches, or town storm did not succeed quickly to each other, never more pleased or more calm than in the midst of all. As may be supposed, this disposition made him long for an engagement with the Spaniards, and form a variety of projects to bring one about, but knowing the prudent enemy he had to deal with, he determined to surprise him by night. Previous to the execution of his project, he had detached parties to secure all the country round him. The Earl of Berry, with twenty thousand men, had taken Orlac, Figeac, Cahors, and Villefranche, so that all the country behind him was secure, and the enemy possessed the route by which they advanced. Having prepared everything by calling in all his detachments the better to deceive the Duke, he gave out that he should march immediately to succour Rouen, which was besieged by the French king. He accordingly provided a vast quantity of baggage, ammunition, and artillery wagons, pressed all the horses of the country into his service, and in short gave directions in such a manner that every one fully believed he was on the point of departing. When the day came on which he meditated the attack, the 23rd of June, the troops were all directed to wait for orders, and it was expected that the next morning they would begin their march. But about ten o'clock they were all drawn up in order of battle. 
and George, dividing them into two bodies, placed one under the command of the Duke of Devonshire, and headed the other himself. The Duke was to make a little detour of a mile and a half through some woods which led to the Spanish camp, while the King himself took the same direction through the plain. Both parties were to meet and make the attack in concert. Nothing could be executed in a better order. The troops, to their great surprise, filed off without the beat of drum or sound of trumpet, and by half an hour after eleven arrived at the very verge of the enemy's camp. The king, joining his forces and giving orders to the duke, the Earl of Berry, and General Young, who were to command the three attacks, while himself overlooked all at the head of a chosen body of troops, directed them to advance, with orders not to fire a musket till they were in the midst of the camp. The three divisions moved at the same instant, and had advanced a considerable way into the camp before they were discovered the Spaniards being all asleep in their tents. A grenadier attempted to knock down a sentinel, was resisted, whereupon he fired at him, and the noise immediately aroused some contiguous tents, who upon this spread a general alarm and ran half-naked to their arms, but found the English advancing to the very centre of their camp. They attempted to resist, but were broken dispersed in an instant. The Duke of Lerma himself by this time was at the head of a confused party, and attempting to form them. But five-and-twenty field-pieces which the king had brought with him were placed so advantageously that every attempt of such a nature was ineffectual. The duke flew like lightning through his camp to bring his men to some order. All the Spanish generals exerted themselves, but their stand was momentary. Terror stalked before the English wherever they moved. Nothing could resist the impetuosity of their attacks. All was one scene of horror and confusion. The enemy was everywhere dispersed in the utmost disorder about their camp, and cut to pieces in regiments. To complete the carnage, the Earl of Berry, turning the cannon of three redoubts on the flying troops, mowed them down in squadrons. By break of day the action was over. The whole Spanish army was totally dispersed with incredible slaughter, and the loss of their general, who was killed in the confusion that necessarily attended such an action. Never was victory more complete. Twenty-two thousand Spaniards were killed and ten thousand made prisoners. All their camp baggage and artillery, standards, colors, drums, and other trophies without number were taken, besides their military chest. They suffered great loss in their retreat, so that out of fifty thousand who came out, scarce ten thousand returned to their own country. This decisive victory was a fatal stroke to Spain, and almost ruined Philip's affairs. The news of it was as a thunderbolt to him. After gaining so great a victory in such advantageous circumstances and with the most trifling loss, there was nothing to stop the rapidity of the king's conquests. He divided his army into three divisions, and all Languedoc, Provence, Dauphiné, Gascon, Guienne, Quercy, Perigord, Limousine, and Saintonge were conquered comprehending near four hundred miles of territory. But it is time to take a view of Philip's operations which will exhibit a very different picture. He was no sooner master of Paris than he marched into Normandy and laid siege to Rouen, expecting to be master of it in a few days. But his hopes of such speedy success were blasted, for he found the brave governor, General Stanley, returned a haughty answer to his demand of surrendering but as it was absolutely necessary that the city should be taken before he attempted anything farther, and as no time was to be lost, he opened nine batteries against it at once, in expectation of obliging the governor to surrender by the fury of his fire. But after a week's dreadful cannonade he was not nearer his point than when he first began the attack. With much vexation he was at last obliged to open the trenches, and a slow siege could not but be fatal to his affairs. Yet he trusted to the Duke of Lerma's keeping George engaged till he was master of it. In this situation he continued his approaches for some time, but saw little prospect of his being able to carry the city. At last advice was brought that the King of England had totally defeated the Spaniards, a terrible blow to Philip. He was at first struck dumb with surprise, but recovering himself ordered the siege to be raised immediately and falling back to Paris, entrenched his army under the walls of his capital. Every day brought him accounts of whole provinces overrun by George, and seeing that his affairs were on the brink of ruin, he determined to sue for peace, and accordingly sent two ambassadors to the British monarch. 
but he was answered that it was now too late for a peace, that France had been the aggressor in the war, and that he must expect no other terms but those his sword procured him. His Majesty quickly followed this answer with all his forces. He left Rodet in the beginning of July, and moved with great expedition towards Paris. Footnote. The Battle of Espalion was fought on June 23rd. The King moved on Paris about July the 5th. How did he find time in ten days to conquer Provence, Languedoc, and the other remote provinces? The chronology needs recasting. End footnote. In fifteen days he reached its neighborhood, and encamping at Dampierre, went immediately to reconnoitre Philip's entrenchments. Saletta had done everything in his power to make them as strong as possible, but their extent rendered them weak, although they contained eighty thousand men entrenched to the teeth. George, drawing nearer, determined to attack them without delay. He pointed out three places to his generals at which to make the principal efforts. At one he commanded himself, and the Duke of Devonshire and the Earl of Berry the other two. The prodigious boldness of the attempt made some advise the king against it, but his ardent temper made him reject their opinion. It was expected that this action would be one of the bloodiest ever fought. The king made the attack at three o'clock in the morning of the 24th of July, but it could hardly be called a battle. In half an hour the whole French army gave way. Dispirited by so many defeats and engaging in expectation of being conquered, instead of fighting like men they fled like sheep. Philip, with the Dauphin, his brother on one side of him and Saletta on the other, attempted to rally his men. But it was impossible, and in the flight he was taken prisoner by the Earl of Berry, to whom he delivered his sword. The Dauphin was also taken, and Marshal Saletta. The loss of the French amounted to about fifteen thousand men in killed and prisoners, and the whole army was totally dispersed. This victory threw the whole kingdom of France into George's possession. He had now no long marches to make, his enemy had no resource. All was lost. From the frontiers of Spain to the extremities of Holland the whole territory was in his hands. The king of Spain, or, rather, his haughty minister, was seized with terror. They repented having provoked a prince, whom they were in fear would take a severe revenge. All Europe trembled at the name of George, and it was next to evident that he was now become invincible. But the same success attended his arms in the remotest corners of the world. We before mentioned the Duke of Grafton sailing with his victorious fleet to the coast of Spain. His grace's actions on that station were not so brilliant as those in the Baltic, but almost equally ruinous to the Spaniards. Too weak to face the English squadron, the Spanish fleet kept in port. Thirty sail of the line besides frigates and other ships were at anchor in the harbour of Cadiz. The Duke, finding there was no probability of the enemy's venturing out, formed the design of attacking the forts of the city, and burning the Spanish fleet. There was a vastness in all this nobleman's schemes that showed a great and daring genius. During the reign of George the Third, admirals watched the fleets of their enemies and spent whole months ineffectually, and yet that was a brilliant period. But now in the age of George the Sixth, the British admirals did not watch, but forced the ports of their enemies. The Duke executed his plan with great success. With the loss of only one ship he burnt nine sail of the line, fifteen frigates, and sixty-four merchantmen. He then entered the Straits, and falling in with a small Spanish squadron, took from Alicant to Gibraltar, to take in their guns, he took four sail of the line and three frigates, dispersing the rest. Footnote. Gibraltar then was no longer in British hands, but a Spanish arsenal. Presumably it had been lost during the unfortunate wars of George V. In footnote. In the West Indies, Admiral Newport met with yet greater successes. Having landed General Cannon and his men at New Orleans, he sailed to the island of Cuba, and without any assistance reduced it. That immense island once more came under the dominion of Great Britain, and with it a prodigious sugar trade. Footnote. Havana had been in our hands in 1762 at the end of the Seven Years' War, but was surrendered at the peace of 1763. End footnote. The general, having collected the troops of the colony of Louisiana to the amount of 15,000 men, began a very long march toward Mexico. Footnote. An incredible way of invading Mexico. 
any invader with possession of the sea would have landed at vera cruz as did the americans in eighteen forty six in footnote but as the country through which he proceeded was tolerably well cultivated and having the advantage of conveying his artillery etc by several noble rivers he soon entered the spanish colonies footnote it is difficult to see how the rio grande or any other stream would thus help a force marching on mexico all the great rivers run across not parallel to the invaders road in footnote where the weakness of their government was very visible he met with no resistance but proceeding on his march arrived at the opulent city of mexico it surrendered on the first summons and in three months he conquered the whole country together with the isthmus across from la vera cruz to acapulco nothing could be more fatal to the spaniards than the loss of these immense regions the trade of them was a great and valuable increase to that of great britain but these operations were performed in concert with another in the east indies the end of admiral clinton's expedition was the conquest of the philippine islands this fleet being rendezvoused at batavia was joined by fifteen sail of the line of the company's ships and ten thousand of their land forces footnote the east india company then was still in full existence in nineteen twenty and batavia was english presumably we had taken the dutch east indies when the french conquered holland in footnote they proceeded immediately for the object of their enterprise so great a force in that part of the world could meet with little or no resistance manila was taken after an attack of two hours and all the islands were successively reduced to obedience the government of them his majesty entrusted to the company the accession of wealth was immense since these vast conquests concurred to command a vast and open trade which was carried on almost immediately from acapulco to manila in short all the riches of the spaniards or their most valuable riches their trade for the mines of mexico were exhausted long before fell into the hands of the english but events were happening in europe which drew the attention of all the world footnote in eighteen ninety eight they still gave seventy per cent of mexico's total exports in footnote the king of great britain no longer seeing an enemy in the field entered paris with great pomp and placed his headquarters in the louvre he sent the duke of devonshire at the head of forty thousand men to attack spain and distributed thirty thousand more in garrisons throughout france the remainder of his army which amounted to thirty two thousand was part encamped in the neighbourhood of paris and part distributed in that city he had besides twenty thousand more in holland under general summers he left this army in the same position on account of the neighbourhood of the russians the czar peter was yet engaged in a skirmishing tedious war with small parties of the danes whom he found it impossible to quell at once besides he could use but a small part of his power for he was at war with the turks and finding so much business on his hands he was utterly unable to attack george the duke of devonshire had no sooner passed the apennines footnote a curious slip for the pyrenees in footnote than he broke into catalonia and overrunning the whole province sat down before barcelona all spain was alarmed terrified at the attack the haughty minister himself saw the immediate necessity of appeasing george he sent ambassadors to paris to sue for peace who met with no very favourable reception they made many proposals which the king rejected at last george in a memorial informed their court that he would make peace on no other terms than the following one that the king of spain shall cede all the conquests of the english in the east and west indies to great britain as an indemnification for the expenses of the war footnote this would leave spain south america but no other part of her colonial empire in footnote two that the king of spain shall acknowledge the king of great britain as king of france three that the king of great britain shall relinquish his conquests in catalonia in consideration of the king of spain ceding the island of sardinia to philip of france which he shall enjoy forever with the title of king footnote how and when sardinia had become spanish we cannot tell presumably when the sicilians overran italy End footnote. for some time the court of madrid refused to accede to these conditions but finding the king's determination fixed and barcelona in the duke of devonshire's possession and dreading to see george at the head of his army in spain they at last agreed to them the czar peter and philip were both invited to accede to the treaty and the latter had his liberty promised him and the island of sardinia if he did 
the difference that subsisted between great britain and russia did not prove the least obstacle and philip tired out with ill fortune and seeing the impossibility of recovering either his kingdom or his liberty agreed to the conditions prescribed by george an english fleet wafted him his brother and many of the french nobility to the island of sardinia which he took possession of the king of great britain generously made him a present of fifty thousand pounds to settle his court and treated him during his captivity with all the politeness imaginable the peace was no sooner signed than it was proclaimed at london and paris and his majesty was crowned king of france at rheims the sixteenth of november nineteen twenty before an immense concourse of british and french nobility etc after leaving the duke of devonshire to command in that kingdom in december he embarked at calais and arrived in england end of chapter ten recording by philip gould chapter nine of the reign of george the sixth nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine a d nineteen twenty one to nineteen twenty two state of the kingdom the parliament meets arts sciences and literature academy of literature university gardens of stanley public works manufactures prosperity of the american colonies after such great fatigue as the king had suffered in the last campaign it may be supposed that he longed to enjoy a situation of peace and tranquillity and it is very remarkable that no man ever knew better how to taste the hurry and noise of war or the ease of retirement he was equally calculated for both but he was too good a politician to disarm himself as soon as the peace was signed a conduct which has often been fatal to conquerors never were measures taken with greater prudence to secure possession of the kingdom he had conquered he knew that all europe looked at his victories with the utmost jealousy and sickened at the verdure of his laurels he was fully persuaded that the late peace had only given time to his enemies to prepare more effectually for a fresh war the spanish monarch at once inveterate and formidable he foresaw would aim at a second alliance against him therefore as his situation was so critical he determined to leave as little as possible to chance but to keep himself always ready for action this plan was most easily executed for although great britain still felt the burden of a prodigious national debt yet the parliament granted him very ample supplies both to carry on the war in france and to build new ships repair others to sink docks and make harbors the king's designs on france indeed had raised some heats in the house of commons but these were all blown over the vast splendor of success reconciled every mind to the measure and what had no little influence was the economy of the king they found that the supplies they granted were applied with the utmost fidelity to the uses they were intended they expected at the opening of the session after their congratulatory addresses were passed to have many demands for securing the vast conquests which the king had made but they were much surprised when they found none made the lord high treasurer informed them by the king's order that the establishment in france would fully support itself and pay off all the arrears of the army this was most agreeable news to all who feared the immense expense of keeping that kingdom only forty thousand men were voted therefore as the standing troops of great britain and ten thousand in ireland thirty thousand seamen were demanded and agreed to without opposition and five thousand in ireland the other services were all supplied with ease cheerfulness and alacrity but there was one circumstance which pleased the king in this as in some other sessions its meeting at stanley where he had summoned them he there found himself in the midst of his own creation and was never so well pleased as when he was engaged in raising noble piles of architecture in conversing with men of genius and planning further establishments in favor of the arts and sciences had the other princes of europe been possessed of such a philosophic disposition george would never have attacked his neighbors he was far more pleased to be at the head of an academy at stanley than of a victorious army conquering a great kingdom four years were now elapsed footnote nineteen twenty one in footnote since george had been able to attend to his buildings at this noble city with that care and oversight which he desired his residence there was but by snatches 
He now and then caught a month flying, but the city was much enlarged in his absence. He had entrusted the management of the buildings to Gilbert, but every one who built houses was left at liberty in every point but the front. The sight of every street formed a regular one, and fancy itself could not form an idea of anything more truly magnificent than all the streets of Stanley. They exhibited all that was great and elegant with the utmost variety that genius could invent. And as this superb city was evidently become the metropolis of the three, or rather four, kingdoms, the streets increased prodigiously. Most of the nobility and gentry spent their winters at Stanley, the seat of everything that could charm the wise, the rich, and the luxurious. London was already degenerated into a mere trading capital, and the king was every day planning the removal of those offices which it was in his power to transport to his favorite city. His majesty ordered Comins, the architect, to draw the plan of an edifice designed for the chancery. That ingenious designer brought him the sketch of the building as it now remains, but it was not equal to some other works at Stanley nor indeed to several churches of Comyn's raising, in which he was peculiarly excellent. Yet the chancery is a very noble building, and does honour to its author. It contains immense apartments for the several courts of law. But the grand design which drew the attention of the whole kingdom was the Cathedral of St. John, now building under the care of Gilbert. That great man, whose invention perhaps was never exceeded, was indebted to nothing but his imagination for the design of that astonishing edifice. Its architecture, grandeur and extent, far exceeds St. Peter's at Rome, and it is certainly one of the greatest monuments of George's magnificence, and even a wonder of the world. In the year 1921, Stanley, besides this superb cathedral, contained forty-three parish churches, many of them famous over the whole world for their architecture. The city had grown to be four miles in length, and near as much in breadth. Among those glorious establishments which reflect so bright a lustre on the reign of this great king, one of the most distinguished was the Academy of Polite Learning. It was certainly very wonderful that all the kingdoms in Europe should have their academies near four centuries before Great Britain, but George supplied the want of everything that reflected an honour on his country. This noble institution consisted of a president and of a number of members which was not fixed. The former had two thousand pounds a year, and the latter three hundred each. The first creation was of twenty-three members, and perhaps no period of time can display a brighter union of geniuses. The most distinguished were Howe, whose essays, letters, discourses, and poetical pieces gained him such a great reputation both for his learning and genius. He was the president. Reynolds, whose tragedies are so famous, Young, the comic writer, Price, the author of our British epic, Miners, Wilson, and Philipson, all wrote both admirable tragedies and comedies, Walpole, whose sketches on many subjects are so elegant and pleasing, Krauss, Charlton, and Earl in history. Charlton's history of Britain was perhaps never exceeded. But it would be tedious to name all their celebrated works, which are now in everybody's hands. Never was any institution better calculated for refining the English language or for promoting literature in all its branches. The prizes which were every year given for the best tragedies, comedies, and essays on a variety of subjects, at the same time that they raised a spirit of emulation, were a means of enriching the votaries of genius. George was solely bent on rendering the city of Stanley the steed of everything that was either useful or elegant. The Duke of Suffolk, his favourite minister, hinted to him one day in conversation the foundation of a university. The king considered of the scheme, and liking a plan that would adorn the city with so many noble buildings as the colleges, determined at last to put it in execution. The Academy of Architecture furnished plans, and the king gave each member a noble opportunity of rivalling each other. The author of each plan that was approved was permitted by the king to be the architect. Nothing could excel the magnificent establishments which were made in favour of this new university. The professors, masters, etc., were all appointed with the utmost consideration. None but men of unblemished morals and great learning were advanced to any posts in it. Scholars, not only from all parts of the king's dominions, but from all Europe, flocked to be admitted in the University of Stanley, which had many advantages that could be enjoyed by no other. What still increasing their ardour was its economy. The bounty of the king made it one of the cheapest seminaries for the education of youth in the world. 
No plan could have ornamented Stanley with a greater number of noble edifices. All the colleges, but particularly St. George's, are admirable, and perhaps the world cannot boast such a number of buildings with so few faults. St. John's is the worst, but St. George's, of which Gilbert was the architect, is inferior to no edifice of its kind in the world. But while these celebrated piles of magnificence were raising, the king was employed some part of his time in laying out the gardens of his palace. He neglected any such additions for some years. The woods which almost surrounded him were of themselves so beautiful. But at last he formed the scheme of sketching gardens equal to his palace. He drew several plans himself. These amusements and employments were worthy such a monarch as George, and no man could succeed in them better. Behind the palace the vast woods of oak and beech almost joined the building. The king laid out a grass lawn to the back front half a mile long and a quarter broad, and round it to a considerable distance made it beautifully picturesque. The appearance of art was entirely banished. Nature was never forced but assisted. He dug an immense piece of water of one hundred acres and raised a mountain by it which is certainly one of the most beautiful spots in the world. By means of a prodigious quantity of masonry he formed many precipices, which in some places almost hung over the water. These were covered with mould to a great depth, and the whole hill presented the view of one beautiful hanging wood of beech, here and there adorned with a little temple or spire peeping just above the trees, which made the whole most beautifully romantic. From off the hill was seen at some distance a noble prospect, and you looked down on the lake surrounded with woods and lawns. Nothing unnatural was seen throughout the whole garden. No studied magnificence, very few fountains but many cascades, which tumbling down artificial rocks, lost themselves in meandering currents through the embrowning shades. In this beautiful garden there was scarcely one straight walk except the grand lawn above mentioned. Everything was irregular and natural. In many places sheep and other cattle were feeding, and as many foreign birds and harmless beasts as possible were procured to run about the woods which were full of hares, rabbits, and pheasants. In short, this garden, which may be considered as a work of eminent genius, was formed on the mere plan of guiding nature. The grass was almost everywhere kept in excellent order, but the woods had no other improvement but the intermixing of the most beautiful flowering shrubs irregularly amongst the trees and instead of letting the surface be generally flat, hills and a thousand imperceptible variations were made to render it more pleasing. The water naturally ran in one channel, but the king threw it into many, and it fell down a variety of cascades, but all without any appearance of art. Never was anything on the whole more beautiful or more truly picturesque. These gardens, which were about five miles in circuit, may be considered as the finest in the world, and far beyond those celebrated ones of Versailles, of which historians speak so highly. But it was at the same time highly to this great king's honour that his amusements did not encroach on his more important occupations. George was not only magnificent but humane. His attention to those establishments that only advanced the national glory did not call him off from such as were dictated merely by his benevolence and humanity. The unhappy found in him their best comforter, the poor and needy their surest support. At the time that he was raising palaces and founding academies, hospitals of all kinds were reared with liberality and magnificence throughout the kingdom. The scheme and execution of the country hospitals were the effects of his goodness, nay, the very plan was his own thought. Whatever county would raise half the necessary sum for any of those seminaries of the poor or miserable, the king granted the other half. Happy nation! to have such amiable qualities mixed with the more dazzling brightness of their monarch's mind. Twenty foundling hospitals were erected at his sole expense in different parts of Great Britain and Ireland. The hint of these useful foundations was taken from one that was established for a few years in the reign of George the Second, but it came to nothing for want of proper care. However, those raised by the king proved to be, and now continue, most excellent establishments. Before the year 1925 His Majesty had built, and either wholly or in part endowed, thirty-five hospitals. Nothing was omitted by George that added to the strength and security of his kingdom, which he considered equally with its ornament. 
Vast works were raised at all the seaport towns in Great Britain and Ireland to defend the coast from all insult. Docks for building ships were made at every place where there was a sufficient depth of water. New men of war were constantly building in them and old ones repairing, so that he was at all times prepared to wage war on any sudden emergency. Vast arsenals and magazines were erected at all the most distinguished harbors, Plymouth, Milford, Chatham, Hall, Edinburgh, footnote, this does not argue much topographical knowledge of the Scottish capital, but Leith is no doubt meant, in footnote, and Cork, might separately be considered as real wonders of strength and greatness. Each of them was capable of fitting out a greater fleet than any single kingdom in the world. Besides these, there were many ports of less consequence for the building and rendezvous of small men of war and frigates. The coasts of the two islands were almost entirely surrounded with works which were at once their ornament and defense. Rivers that formerly were almost useless were now navigated by large barges which increased the trade of innumerable towns and raised in many places new ones. Canals were cut which joined rivers and formed a communication from one part of the kingdom to the other. The spirit of trade attended these prodigious works. Villages grew into towns and towns became cities. An infinite number of manufactures flourished all over the kingdom. None were so inconsiderable as not to enjoy the king's patronage, who examined into the minutest branches, and by the vast and penetrating capacity of his genius, attained a full comprehension of most arts. He understood their interests and knew when and how to promote them. By these means he raised and supported them at a small expense, and did as much real service to trade with one hundred thousand pounds, as many princes and even great ones have performed with treble the sum. But the immense region of country which the English possessed in North America was what most extended and forwarded the British manufactures. The king was their sovereign of a tract of much greater extent than all Europe. The constitution of the several divisions of that vast monarchy was admirably designed to keep the whole in continual dependence on the mother country. There were eleven millions of souls in the British North American Dominions in the year 1920. Footnote. In 1899 the population of Canada and the United States is about 75 million. End footnote. They were in possession of perhaps the finest country in the world, and yet had never made the least attempt to shake off the authority of Great Britain. Indeed, the multiplicity of governments which prevailed over the whole country, the various constitutions of them, rendered the execution of such a scheme absolutely impossible. Footnote. Sad words to read when we consider that the colonies were to be goaded into revolt within fifteen years, and to be an independent state ere twenty had elapsed. In footnote. This wide extended region which increased its people so surprisingly fast was far from being forgot by the king. Many noble harbors were surrounded with towns and made naval magazines. A prodigious number of ships were built by order from Great Britain and the Royal Navy itself boasted many very fine vessels that were launched in America. In a word, this was the Augustan age of Great Britain. The fictitious times which received their being only from the imagination of poets were realized in this happy country. It seldom or never happens that a period in which military glory is carried to its greatest height is also the age of happiness and plenty. But this was the case in the reign of George the Sixth. Britain, at this golden era, was at once glorious and happy. End of chapter 9 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 10 of the Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 A.D. 1922-1925 George the Sixth visits France, government in France, new laws, buildings, encouragement of arts and sciences. George gives both freedom and happiness to France. Fini. A truly benevolent disposition knows no bounds to see the desire of diffusing happiness. George the Sixth longed to see France in possession of that ease and plenty which were now the distinguished characteristics of Great Britain. The Duke of Devonshire, it is true, had governed in that kingdom with abilities and integrity, but it was not in his power to execute the designs of the king, nor was his genius adapted to the business. His majesty determined, therefore, to make a trip thither, and to increase the splendor of his court, 
he took with him great part of the nobility of the kingdom. On his arrival at Paris he fixed his residence at the Louvre, but was disappointed in finding that very few of the first nobility of France waited on him. His court was crowded with Frenchmen, but not men of great importance. George could not condemn this mark of their affection for their former sovereign, but like a wise and benevolent prince resolved to conquer their disaffection by his clemency and the mildness of his government. The kings of France had been absolute monarchs for many centuries. The Parliament of Paris had formerly raised commotions in the kingdom by their obstinacy in refusing to register the royal edicts, but this appearance of liberty was now entirely at an end. George determined to make the French love him and he knew that would be impossible if he did not give them more happiness than his predecessors, and make them no longer regret the loss of their former kings. His management in France was certainly admirable. At the same time that he secured himself against all insurrections, he gratified the conquered people. He raised many French regiments. He promoted a multitude of French officers in English and German corps. He made a mixture of the two nations in almost everything except religion, but he never shocked the people with any innovations in that tender point. He had indeed long laid the plan of rooting superstition and enthusiasm out of the kingdom, but never thought of changing the established religion. By an edict which was registered in Parliament he gave all his French subjects the privilege of both reading and publishing any books with the same limitations as in England. This edict contained the substance of the English laws on that head, and was declared irrevocable. It is difficult to conceive the effect which this change had at Paris. A sullen silence had reigned throughout the kingdom, but almost at once it was succeeded by a boundless torrent of flattery and invective. The king looked on with calmness, and was highly satisfied at the pleasure the whole nation experienced in this new liberty. A multitude of indirect libels on him were printed but many ingenious men defended George, and gave him excessive praise for this instance of his clemency and philosophic disposition. The lower people were shocked at the great number of books that swarmed from the press which ridiculed and subverted the Roman Catholic religion, but the sensible part of the nation rejoiced to find that no subject was so sacred as to bar common sense from the consideration of it. Every man published his sentiments with the utmost freedom on all subjects. The king, who had a sublime notion of morals and religion, ordered a vast number of the best English books to be translated into French, and printed at the Louvre. Those spread with the other publications over all France opened the eyes of the more sensible, and even awakened some of the ignorant, to a sense of the absurdities of popery. The Abbe de Mancière, particularly by His Majesty's directions, composed a most elaborate dissertation to prove that monasteries and nunneries were most pernicious to the state. The king seemed an enemy to no part of religion but that which was prejudicial to the civil state of the kingdom. This noble freedom which the French had so long lost gave rise to a thousand useful and excellent treatises, both in morals and politics. All other arts were also benefited by it. But it was not in this article alone that George showed his desire of making the conquered nation happy. By an edict which will be immortal, he introduced the laws of England into France with no changes, but such as respected religion and his own authority. He even gave up every prerogative which he did not possess in England, except the raising of money. Parting with that would have been dangerous so soon after his possession. As the French nation had always preserved a notion of liberty, and had never fallen absolutely into slavery, the effect of these changes was surprising. They seemed to enjoy them with particular exultation, as they came from the hand of their conqueror. Happy for France that it was conquered by such a patriotic king. The only set of men who at first appeared discontented with these changes was the nobility. They were no longer the absolute lords on their own estates they had heretofore been. The meanest peasant was now free and could not suffer but by judgment of his peers. But in return for the loss of that power which it was dishonorable to use, they had many noble privileges confirmed to them unknown to their ancestors. They were no longer the slaves of their monarch, and the first to bear his fury. The king himself had no more authority over them than over the lowest mechanic. How unusual was it in France to see uncorrupt judges going the circuits of the provinces who enjoyed their salaries fixed for life, and had no inducement to favor either side. 
During this residence in France, so happy for the kingdom, the king built a very noble palace at Fontainebleau. Footnote. Apparently our author is ignorant of the very noble palace already existing there since the time of Francis I. In footnote. And another on the banks of the Rhone. He also repaired the Louvre and many other public buildings, and neglected nothing that could add to the ornament of the kingdom. The fortifications of the frontier towns from the north of Holland to the Mediterranean, which had in many provinces fallen into decay, were repaired and even augmented. The royal ports were filled with workmen of all sorts. Great numbers of ships from men of war to merchantmen were built. His Majesty's navy was continually augmenting, and as the two nations now possessed an immense trade, there was no danger of ever finding a scarcity of sailors. The monarch who in England had been so great and magnificent a protector of the arts and sciences, acted worthy of himself in France. The French nation had enjoyed more establishments in favour of literature such as academies than Great Britain, but they were in general only honorary. Men of the greatest genius were often members of many academies, but almost starving for want. George therefore found no want of fresh establishments, but only the fixing certain salaries on the seats of those already in being. This he did with a liberality unknown in France, and greatly to his honour. Few conquerors were ever celebrated for such excellencies as this great monarch. The panegyrics on him, which were numerous and just, did not turn on his victories, but his philosophic disposition and his civil virtues. Prejudice and partiality, which so often throw a veil over the real characters of princes, can find few faults with this great king's administration. His conduct, especially in France, has been blamed by many politicians, but no philosophers. In fact, George ought rather to be considered as a philosophical king than a consummate politician. He had too many virtues to shine greatly in the latter character. Yet those men who have blamed so much the political conduct of the king in giving liberty to a great kingdom speak merely as politicians. But George's memory will outlast every reflection of this nature, and virtue will triumph in spite of the most scandalous misrepresentation. In some instances his conduct was certainly faulty, but he never committed an error which did not proceed from a good motive. However, the strongest proof of the excellence of all his opinions is the universal praise that is bestowed on his memory by all foreign historians. His name was as dear to France as it was to Great Britain. Fortunate nations to possess a king formed by nature to make the world he governed happy. End of chapter 10 End of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925, a forecast written in the year 1763, by Samuel Madden. Recording by Philip Gould.